Hi, um, my name is Robin Scott and I have had quite a long history with WRDA, although I'm not that old yet, <laughs> but basically I worked for WRDA, I think it was possibly even 10 years ago now, um, so I was the membership and communications worker. Now I was only in post for about a year and a half, um, but it, it was it was a really memorable job and um, even though I was only with WRDA in that capacity for a short time, um, I could see how much good work the organisation was doing then. Um, and I particularly enjoyed while I was in that role the, the um, membership part of, of the job, so just engaging with loads of different groups, loads of different individuals. And at that time I was actually based downstairs in reception, um, so I also enjoyed that aspect of it, just getting to greet everybody as they came in. Um, so. It really helped me get to know the women's sector in Northern Ireland, which I suppose career-wise and, and personally, like it was just, that was really good. And um, I've continued to like keep in touch with a lot of the people I met initially back then. Um, so so since, since that time, I've gone on to do a couple of other jobs. So I worked for an education programme and now I currently work for a human rights NGO. But I have come back to WRDA in a different capacity. So I joined the management committee I think it was in 2018 just as a normal member um, but since then I have had a spell as vice chair of the management committee and at the moment I am the current chair so I've only been doing that for just over a year now um, but it has been going quite well um, and I would say you know being on the management committee just like you know the whole time really it's really opened my eyes even more to how much WRDA does. Um, so I would say the organisation has expanded since I worked for it as well, but I think it's given me a much higher level of sort of oversight over, you know, what all the different staff were doing. Whereas when I worked for WRDA, obviously I was primarily thinking about what I was doing. Um, and it, it's just been very interesting and it has been wonderful to see the organisation just grow in that way. And I would say grow as a team as well. Um, um, so yeah, it's, it's still a very impressive organisation and I am pleased that I've been able to come back and sort of reignite my involvement with WRDA. Tell us a bit about yourself and your journey as a feminist. Um, okay, so I think that's quite like a loaded question probably for most feminists. Um, yeah, especially I th think in my case, as weird as this is going to sound, um, I would have say I've considered myself to be a feminist from uh, like basically as soon as I understood the concept. Um, so even as a child <laughs> and certainly as like a, a young teenager, I would have called myself a feminist. Um, I'm not entirely sure where that came from exactly, um, but I guess just... Uh, I just suppose at certain points in my childhood, I was, ex I was like, you know, exposed to the concept of feminism and I knew just from reading that I agreed with it. Um, I also have just never seen anything that made me think that women weren't, you know, the equal to men. Um, but of course, like, you know, back then being a feminist just meant I agreed with the ideals um, and, you know, it was only obviously as I got older into adulthood that, you know, I started to become more active around feminism. Um, so I've also worked around, you know, human rights in general as well and equality. So I would have done like volunteering around that, you know, when I when I was a student and like after my, my years as a student. But I suppose the first role I had, you know, with where I was working for an organisation with a feminist ethos was when I joined WRDA. So I would say that job just really broadened my understanding of what, you know, feminism meant. Um, which was really great, like, and it um, helped me connect with other feminists, um, which actually was a really positive part of the job because I think um, when I was growing up, I would say, although I feel like a lot of my friends would have made feminist choices and would have had opinions that were, you know, tied in with feminism, I would say most of my friends would not have called themselves a feminist. So it was just so refreshing to suddenly be connected with loads of people who would actually were not afraid to use the word or whatever else was holding up, you know, other people from, from saying it. Um, so yeah, feminism is a, is like a huge part of who I am now. Um, I just think that like, so when you're, 
born, you know, there are various factors that might make your life a bit harder. And unfortunately, I still think one of them is, is if you're born female, um, just in terms even of how people in like Northern Ireland will treat you. Um, you know, and it is, it's very disappointing. Um, I mean, in some ways I've been, I've been very lucky, but you know, in other ways, I would say definitely misogyny has impacted my life um, on occasion with how obviously men in particular have treated me. Um, so it's just very important to me that we all keep working to make, you know, Northern Ireland fairer for women, safer for women as well. I think that's hugely important. Um, and uh, yeah, I think I will just always continue to consider myself to be a feminist. And, uh, but I hope one day it's not as important as it is now uh, to be a feminist. Like I hope things do get better and do get more equal. Um, although like I said, I will, I will always stay a feminist throughout my life. Can you outline the role of the Management Committee and how it contributes to organisational resilience? So I'm the current chair of the Management Committee, um, but I very much see what we do as like a group effort between all of us mem members. Um, so well, I'm giving my own view on, on, on the role here, but um, I'm not saying I necessarily <laughs> speak for everybody. But basically, in my own personal view, I see the role of the Management Committee um, in a in, in a very broad sense to ensure that there is good govern governance um, you know over uh, WRDA and its activities um, which is quite a dry thing to say but I just mean making sure that everything is you know being done in a way that is like obviously within the law in a way that ensures you know WRDA has enough funding and it ensures that like everything at the high level is, is going smoothly but also I think another part of that as well is just ensuring that um, um, Anne McVicker as the current director, you know, has support in the governance as well. But I don't see it as just that. Um, so I think that's that's a bit too narrow. And I also think when you just talk about good governance, it kind of excludes the sort of staff aspect. So obviously the WRDA staff are, are a huge, huge part of the overall WRDA team as well. So in my own view, I really see supporting the WRDA staff as well as the director um, as, as a hugely important role the management committee has. Um, so by that, I guess I just mean, you know, building up a good relationship with them. Um, I, I also mean just understanding the work they're doing um, and supporting it when we can by attending WRDA events, all of that kind of thing. And just making sure that like, and this thankfully hasn't happened recently, but any like internal issues that are arising within WRDA are dealt with in like the best possible way with the best outcome for everyone. Um, so one thing I have been trying to do as chair is just make sure that I get to know all the staff members. Um, and something I'm still working on, obviously, but um, you know, it has been really nice to start building those relationships and I plan to continue to do that. So I think when a management committee is run well, it does play a very important role in organizational resilience. So what I mean by that is the management committee shouldn't be working in a silo. It should be being a very important functional part of WRDA or any organization's wider work. Um, but in terms of organizational resilience, I suppose there are a few aspects to that that like would immediately spring to my mind. So one of those would actually be just to do with funding. So I suppose just in the sense of oversight, um, the management committee should just be making sure that WRDA is being supported in pursuing like the funding it needs um, and also has support in terms of addressing like any issues that might arise in that area. I think it's also about making sure that the staff themselves are receiving enough support. So. I suppose by that, um, you know, approving training opportunities, um, hearing from the staff, um, making sure that the staff have opportunities as well to present directly to the management committee and just building really strongly those um, organisational links. And I think a massive part of that is also ensuring, and I've already mentioned this, uh, you know, previously, but ensuring that the director, um, Anna Vicker at present, has support because like managing WRDA now is a huge job. I mean, it's it's grown so much as an organization in recent years. And I just think it's so important that, you know, the director 
is getting access to you know support with any issues she's experiencing but also has a chance to su share the successes and to like be told yeah you know you're doing a really good job and I would say the same goes for all the staff I think a part of building organizational resilience it isn't just about like identifying when stuff's going wrong it's about like saying why wow, this is going right it's about celebrating the successes and just making sure the team as a whole is happy and also the members of the management committee are, are happy as well i also think one big aspect of it as well is just you know making sure that like evaluations are being carried out when they need to be um and I suppose as part of that as well is looking at the skill set of the management committee and of the staff team looking for any gaps but also again just identifying the strengths and working out like um what maybe untapped resources even wrda has that can be used to further build organizational resilience how does wrda ensure our management committee accurately reflects the diversity of the women's movement so I'll just start by saying I do think it's really important that the management committee is reflecting the diversity of the women's um, movement in Northern Ireland um, because um, the work the WRDA itself does is so important for like moving forward the, the whole agenda of the women's movement that if we weren't doing that, um, it would be, in my view, a bit of a failing. Um, I do think at the minute the management committee um there, there probably is room for it to be a bit more diverse but one thing i would see as a positive change um in recent years is there is like a wider um, range of ages represented which i think is great because obviously wrda is there for all women in northern Ireland, not a particular age range um we also um would like to increase the diversity in other ways so we might be um, recruiting new members fairly soon. Um, and if that's the case, I think a big part of that process will be thinking about, you know, where do we share this opportunity to make sure it's going to reach like diverse groups um, and isn't obviously only going to be viewed by like, you know, the average white Northern Irish woman. So yeah, that will be definitely something we'll be thinking about. Um, so yeah, I think it, it, it's really important um, to make sure, like, obviously, some of the members are actually drawn specifically from the women's movement in Northern Ireland, but that everybody has an understanding of what the women's movement is trying to achieve. Um, and of course, um, it's going to operate within WRDA's ethos. So just making sure that anybody who's interested in joining is going to be able to, you know, you basically just stand over everything in that ethos um, because obviously you would never want people working at any cross purposes and that would be why um, as things stand that we would have like a, just a little application form and stuff like that so it is quite a simple process for joining but we just do make sure that like everybody understands completely what they're signing up to. I will also say um, I do think there is some sense as well in you know as long as they, they, you know, agree with feminist principles from like bringing in people, you know, external to the women's movement itself as well, because they might be have to bring in, uh, you know, skill sets that people like myself who have worked, you know, for the women's movement might not necessarily have. Um, so it's good to have a bit of diversity in, in that way as well. Um, and one thing I have been talking about doing for a while that I'd like to bring forward is probably when we have a few new members on board, but do a bit of a skills audit. Um, uh, with all the current members just to see you know how we can maximize the potential of the management committee to yeah to help with WRDA's wider work and just to say another way we have tried to ensure like we can have um, a bit of diversity in terms of you know making sure that say you know parents like women who have children can come on board um, and maybe as well you know women who do not necessarily live in Belfast is by offering to pay for like childcare and travel expenses I think stuff like that is hugely important because you can forget I think the level of commitment it can take to be part of a management committee so I think it's really important that we are where we need to you know compensating people with expenses and in other ways for being a part of the management committee. WRDA is proud to have a diverse and involved membership. What is the role of our membership and how does this contribute to organisational resilience? So I think um, one thing that 
sets or helps to set WRDA, you know, apart as an organization in Northern Ireland is that, you know, it has, it's a membership organization, but it, it has a relatively um, active membership. And also I would say, you know, a lot of members, um, I've worked for a few membership organizations and WRDA had by far the most members. And I think that's really good. I think it's very reflective of WRDA's strength as an information sharing and, and you know, networking sort of organization. Um, I feel like the membership um, is very useful because um, there's like a, a not, I don't want to use the word resource, where there's a pool of people for WRDA to draw on whenever they want to seek views about anything, so like a project we're working on, um, or just, I suppose, to learn about what the wider, wider sorry, women's movement in Northern Ireland is thinking. Um, I think, um, yeah, it's, it's, a, it's an aspect of, of WRDA. I'd like us to, to continue to grow our membership. Um, I like us to make sure you know it grows in line with how Northern Ireland's population is changing over the years. Um, but um, as part of my role with WRDA, um, I at the time was in charge of coordinating the membership, um, and yeah, it was one of the aspects of the role I enjoyed most. I'm just engaging with them um, and uh, getting to meet you know our members at events and things like that. Um, I suppose like yeah, same members at events and meetings and things like that it's um it's a very positive you know part of the role because you get to see i suppose a little bit of the impact that wrda is having and you also get to to learn from the members themselves um, which can then help to continue to shape wrda's work throughout our 40 year history wrda and the wider women's sector has had to navigate some difficult times financially and societally. How has WRDA been able to not just survive, but flourish? So I have only really known of and been involved with WRDA for the last 10 or so years. So obviously I can't really speak to longer than that because all I know is what other people have like kind of told me. Um, but basically, I mean, I think a lot of the success of WRDA, a lot of the resilience has just been down to, you know, having brilliant staff members over the years, like really dedicated people who are willing to like keep going and keep working even when things were getting really tough. I also think that WRDA, unlike, you know, some other organizations like, you know, in Northern Ireland in general, has just always had a very clear purpose. Um, I've attended like a lot of strategy days in my time with WRDA and, um, think what we were trying to do, what we we're trying to achieve, it's always been set out so clearly. And I think that really helps. I also think WRDA, you know, does some things that other organizations aren't doing. So like there, there's always been a gap there for the work of WRDA. So just to give like a couple examples off the top of my head um, that are relevant at the minute. So the stuff to do with, um, you know, the community facilitators, um, and all of the like health related courses that WRDA offered. I think that works just amazing. And also the MAS project, which is to do with perinatal health. Again, you know, I think that's come in and, and filled a massive gap that was there before. So I think it has a lot to do with, you know, coming up with those brilliant ideas and then, you know, implementing them in a way that is also brilliant is a big part of why WRDA is still here. I also think another sort of more mundane aspect of it as well has just been that WRDA has always in the end been able to secure the funding that it needs. Now there's been like a lot of difficult times with funding, but um, in my time, I've really seen like that side of things. Like while there will always be some, you know, moments where you might be worried over losing, you know, a particular funding stream, I think WRDA has gotten brilliant at diversifying its funding. Um, and at the minute, everything and that's I think look is looking really healthy. Um, now I know you don't want to focus like you know primarily on the funding when there's so much good work um, going on, but of course you need that funding to keep doing the good work. Um, so I think it's fantastic that WRDA has got to where it has now with, with regards to funding. Um, I also think like I just want to say credit is due to the current um, team. Um, I think they're all doing really well in their roles, and I think. What WRDA has now is a really cohesive team where everyone 
knows how to work well together. Um, and I think that's brilliant. And hopefully that means that going forwards now, um, that will help WRDA continue to like go from strength to strength. I suppose one other final thing that I haven't touched on yet is just like, there is a lot of political instability in Northern Ireland and there has been for many years. But I would say WRDA has shown itself to be, you know, good at adapting to that, which is hugely important. And I also think one thing I want to particularly highlight is how well WRDA adapted when the pandemic was happening. So just internally, um, I think things were handled really well. Um, I like that a big focus was put on staff well-being. Um, that is definitely not something that happened in a lot of organisations. So it was brilliant that that happened in WRDA. And I think as well, the way staff members sort of adapted to the new normal, as it was called at the time, even just seeing things like the feminist recovery plan coming partially out of WRDA, um, it's just brilliant. Um, so yeah, I think uh, that adaptability, that flexibility is also a huge part of why WRDA is still around today. How does WRDA approach building the capacity of the women's sector and creating resilience in the sector? So I think WRDA um, would build resilience in the women's sector in a, in a number of different ways. Um, I think one of the things that first springs to my mind, and I've kind of already touched on this, just is WRDA's membership. Um, so a lot of the members would be drawn specifically from the women's sector here. And I think a couple of things WRDA does really, really well is just like information sharing with the members and also providing them with networking opportunities through events and things like that. Um, I think just having those opportunities to like engage with other people from the women's sector um, is hugely important for strengthening, you know, the sector as a whole. Um, so yeah, WRDA would, would hold a lot of like pretty major events throughout the year. So yeah, it does that really well. Um, I think another way that WRDA builds the resilience is just by offering, you know, projects and services that are really well run really well managed um, and you know if you get a chance to engage in them will be helpful to you um, through the management committee itself like we would have you know members who are drawn from other women's organizations which just you know helps strengthen ties but in particular I think one thing WRDA does very well is like partnership working so like joint joint projects that other women's sector organizations are involved in and also of course the involvement in the women's regional consortium I really think one thing I've seen WRDA do very, very well over the last few years is like joint applications for funding for projects with other women's organizations where it's not about WRDA taking the lead. It's a, really is about bringing those other organizations together and everybody working well. And if another organization is actually the lead partner in something, then that's absolutely fine. Um, and I think just seen some really good successes from, from those joint projects. What do you feel the impact of social media has been on the feminist movement and how have we responded to the opportunities and challenges? So, um, I mean, social media has had a huge impact on everything. Um, it certainly has had a huge impact on the women's sector. I would find it very difficult to define whether it's been positive or negative, if I'm being honest. Um, it, it's, it's a really tricky one because I feel like social media has allowed a lot of groups and organisations and individuals to have a voice when previously you were sort of reliant on getting into the media, you know, you were reliant in like producing like sophisticated like other types of media yourself. So it really has opened things up. And I would say it definitely has helped amplify the voice of WRDA and other organisations. Um, and that's good because it helps you reach people. However, I unfortunately think there is a huge downside to social media because as I've just said, it's sort of given everyone a platform and uh, not all of those people are going to agree with WRDA and not all of those people are going to be nice people. Um, so it's a huge problem. Um, I think if you're not careful, it's very easy to get into, you know, arguments with trolls online. I think it's, and I think unfortunately, not enough is done when you know social media users are actually becoming abusive um i think a lot of that is sort of just still tolerated i think it's really hard 
to you know have any sort of success with reporting people and getting them banned like a lot of the time which is really unfortunate and i think what we have also seen as well um is sometimes members of like the women's sector being specifically targeted with abuse um which has become really rampant and really really nasty and of course as well there's issues with um actual defamation against both individuals and organizations in the women's sector um and the problem there is like even if you can sort of prove defamation has occurred um you know there's not always much you can legally do because a lot of the people who are spreading that kind of misinformation that kind of nastiness are not people that is actually you know possible to sue because they don't, they don't have any assets so like it's it becomes like how do you actually get those sort of people to stop it, it's it's hugely tricky so i mean i think my view would be yeah using social media can definitely be a tool that can be used for good by organizations but i think really around that it's very important i suppose to ensure that staff members are being protected and then also the staff members using social media are adequately, tra adequately trained so that when the negative stuff is happening, it is well managed and doesn't spin out of control. Now, sometimes it will spin out of control anyway, but in some cases there are stuff you can do to sort of limit the damage there. Um, so I think it's very important that organisations like WRDA have really stringent social media policies um, and, you know, procedures. And as well, unfortunately, I think it's also important that there is someone there to seek legal advice from when that becomes necessary. Um, shouldn't be that way. And I, I would like to see the social media platforms themselves start to manage things uh, better over time. But at the moment, unfortunately, I don't really see that being what is happening. Oh, but I will say this, um, having engaged with WRDA's you know, social media myself um, in a personal capacity, and also seen it from the other side when I was working here, I do think it's an aspect of work that WRDA is doing really well um, and I think particularly you know going on to Instagram in recent years has been a really good move and I absolutely love the sort of graphics that are being used at the minute I think the WRDA branding comes across really really well on social media um, so yeah, I can't fault what the staff are doing at all I think they're doing a great job. What do you consider to be the greatest risks to the feminist movement in Northern Ireland? And how can we ensure we are resilient enough to deal with these risks? Well, unfortunately, I do think um, there is quite a lot of risks, you know, facing the feminist movement at the minute. But that's probably always been the case. Um, so it's, I feel like you could write an essay on this. Um, but yeah, I suppose one of the things we were just talking about is the rise of online abuse. Um, it's very common. Feminists are, for whatever reason, seen as like, an easy target I think um, and I suppose it's partly because uh, the things they say you know about women being equal and all that obvious sensible stuff is the kind of thing that is going to enrage someone if they are a troll if they are a misogynist so I think yeah that's a big one I also think and this is more of a general thing but the political instability in Northern Ireland it is getting ridiculous it is beyond a joke that we keep switching from having a government that to be fair doesn't do all that much sometimes anyway but then suddenly we have no government again and um you know we don't know when it's going to come back i think that is very hard to deal with when like the feminist movement you might be trying to like lobby for change um because you're always having to readjust what you're doing so long term i would really like to see some sort of reform in Northern Ireland that gives us a little bit more stability and makes achieving positive change for women, positive change for everyone, a lot easier and makes the lives of like feminist activists a wee bit easier as well. I think in general, um, and I, I'm sad to say this, I think the right has been emboldened and I think a lot of far right people, even mid right people probably are misogynists. Um, that is like, a real shame um i mean you can especially see it with what's been happening in the u.s in terms of the rhetoric at the minute from certain like republican quarters on like trans rights and lgbt stuff as well i mean it's just like in general i mean it's just awful um and you can see some of that starting to transfer over here and i think it's dangerous in itself because then people who you know count themselves as one of those groups they feel targeted and it's not going to help their mental health it's not going to help their outcomes like it's awful in itself 
But I think another aspect of it is like these are really basic issues. Like it's it's a basic thing that we should be treating trans people, gay people, bi people, whatever, with the same respect as anyone else. What's happening is when these arguments get raised, we get mired down in arguing these ridiculous things that shouldn't be even being argued, but it distracts from other issues too. And it's just, it's just so awful. Like as a society, we should have moved past that already. So I feel like the feminist movement gets bogged down in arguments we shouldn't even need to have anymore. And I find that really disappointing. Um, but of course it's important that we keep fighting for those groups. I mean, we have to. So yeah, I see that as a big issue. And, um, <laughs> with a general election probably coming up in the UK soon. I'm just sort of bracing myself for the rise in nonsense that will accompany that. Um, I suppose as well, yeah, a big one for the feminist movement, particularly feminist organisations, it's the cost of living crisis, it's the possible budget cuts. It is the fact that we've had to make budget cuts in Northern Ireland already because we don't have a government. Um, like that's very worrying. Um, I have heard of job losses and I have heard of like organizations losing a funding stream they previously you know had for years um it's very worrying um I really hope that we get a government back and maybe get some extra funding in soon because if not yeah I think that's going to be a really big issue as well um and I guess maybe as well just one thing and this is this is sort of a permanent issue although I think maybe things have improved in recent years but I still think a lot of women who hold what would be completely feminist views, live feminist lives, for some reason a lot of people still don't want to call themselves a feminist. Um, and as someone who's always considered myself a feminist, like I can't really answer why that is, like that's not, that's not for me to say, I don't know. But I think it's a shame and um, I really hope like it's something that further headway can be made on because you know, you shouldn't feel ashamed to call yourself a feminist or be afraid to call yourself a feminist. Um, yeah, I find it really kind of sad. And I, I like, I, I do think though, I think the younger generation is getting more vocal and that's fantastic. So I guess I, I'm just saying, I hope that trend continues. Um, and as well, like I hope the feminist organizations here, you know, will be, will be there to bring in that new generation of, of feminists and embrace them and hopefully move things forward here. What are you most proud of from your time with WRDA so far? And what do you feel as an organisation's greatest achievement? Okay, so from a, I'm going to take the, the first one, what am I most proud of as meaning personally? Um, so honestly, I think it is like coming back and becoming chair of the management committee. Um, yeah, I didn't expect that to happen. Um, so it's been really, really nice because like when I worked for WRDA, the organization was very different at the time. I don't, I don't think it was kind of as stable as it is now. Um, so it has been absolutely wonderful to come back and just see how WRDA is transformed and to now get to play like a little bit of a, of a role along with the other members of the management committee in it, hopefully ensuring that that success continues. So yeah, it's definitely been that. And it, it's been even in a personal capacity, just becoming WRDA chair and you know learning all of what that entails I mean for me personally career wise as well it's been brilliant like I love to learn new things and this has been a really interesting experience so I guess uh, thanks for giving me that opportunity so I'm gonna be honest I think for me the fact that WRDA is still here after all this time not many organizations make it this far that in itself is just an absolutely massive achievement and as I've been sort of saying throughout this, I see where WRDA is now as just being in like this big moment of growth. And I think it has just come so far and the team, the current WRDA team is, is amazing. Like, and everything they're doing is really good. So yeah, I mean, just to even get to that point, but if it was supposed to be drilling down into specifics, now I can only speak to like the last 10 or so years as I've already said, one thing that really sticks out for me would be the feminist recovery plan, um, which was done as part of the women's policy group, but WRDA had like a huge role in that. That was an absolutely amazing piece of work, especially since it was done when we couldn't meet in person yet, you know, that was brilliant. But I also think just in general, and I've kind of already alluded to this in a previous answer, I think WRDA is really good at identifying where there's gaps and finding something to fill it with. So I would say the MAS project as well is something that sticks out in my mind from recent years. 
But honestly, like every time I come to a management committee meeting, I am just so impressed with all of the work that's being reported back to me. So while I've given those two specific examples, I'm sure on another day I would have given two completely different ones. Um, yeah, I just think WRDA has achieved so much and I just want to say a big congratulations to the team. Thanks, Rob. We are still using the same red book to record our annual general meetings. Do you have any memories or any anecdotes about past AGMs? Uh, so I've been at a few of these. Um, I've been there as a staff member and I have been there as a management committee um, member, then vice chair, then chair. I mean, they all do stick in my head in various ways. I think especially because um, there's always like interesting speakers at them. But the one that sticks out most is last year because I had been it I've been chair for like it's been about eight months and for some reason I did not realize I had to chair the AGM um, <laughs> which is like ridiculous so arriving to the shock of realizing I had to run through the agenda yeah that uh that really <laughs> sticks out in my head um but like it all went fine because obviously Anne's like Anne McVicker the director is always really supportive and Geraldine um the finance officer was there as well manager sorry just to talk me through everything so it worked out fine and as usual I had a really good time you know listening to all the speakers um and just you know reconnecting really with everybody who's like highly involved in WRDA um but one other thing I don't think necessarily think this will show up on camera but I think I've just found the first AGM I attended back in 2014 um, so yeah, that would also stick in my head just as it was the very first one I got to. Um, but I always enjoy them. So, and I will be back obviously at this year's one, chairing it again. So yeah, at least this is the time I realise I'll be chairing it. So it will go smoothly. <laughs> Thank you, Robin. Um, you will be at our 40th AGM as, as our chair. But um, ahead of, of the day, do you have a message for that AGM? Ooh. <laughs> I would just say my main message would be hopefully we'll have another 40 years um, and hopefully I'll still be around for it. Um, yeah, I think hitting 80 years, wow, I mean, 40 years is brilliant, but that would be even better. So yeah, that is my message. <laughs> Here's the next 40 years. Yeah. Robin, thank you very much.